Welcome to the NYU Steinhardt Jazz Interview Series. And today, I'd like to welcome Mr. Lenny Pickett. <laughs> Lenny, I want to start by talking about dedication in, in uh, I guess, in music and the arts that really transfers into any vocation. But uh, I want you to talk about uh, your career today, but more importantly, how much dedication it's taken for you to become the, the saxophonist, uh, the musician, the composer, the band leader for SNL over all these years. Because a lot of people think that oh, being an artist is not that difficult, but, uh, but we know behind the scenes that it takes a lot to create a, a unique voice and uh, sustain a career and be accountable throughout your life. Well, um, I think you just have to really want to do it bad. And if you have a strong desire that motivates you to do the work and the work is largely preparatory, um, a lot of practicing involved and stuff that's not very glamorous. Um, but, and it requires consistency. I, I think the, if you apply um, effort over time consistently, you can um, achieve a lot, whether or not you meet um, some sort of goal or not is another question. But I think that goals and plans are a form of narrative, they're a form of story that you tell yourself. So you have an imagination of something that you want, and but that's just a story. And what actually happens is gonna be quite different. But if you have an idea of, you know, if you don't have a plan, it's very difficult to go anywhere. Um, it's like if you don't have a road map, it's hard to know which direction you're headed off into. But if you come up with some sort of idea of what you want your life to be like and what you, what you want your activity to be like, then you can, you know, come up with a, an organization of some sort and think how that might work. And even if it's inexact or wrong, um, you can shape it along the way. Um, my experience, for instance, with working with um, um, the TV show is that um, I come in in the morning with um, an idea of what I want to play that evening with the band. And uh, I have a few extra pieces of music besides what I know I absolutely need. And I play through everything and I see what sounds the best and you know, use the reality of what it sounds like to, to guide me in making the choices about what we actually play. Um, I think the same thing holds true about proceeding along uh, you know, the line of um, endeavor for a, you know, a creative um, career, if you want. I, I don't like to think of it so much as a career, as, a, as an avocation, or as a, uh, something that you would do anyhow. Because for one thing, um, I don't think a lot of these activities are actually um, necessarily going to be careers. Um, there's a lot of people who pursue artistic endeavor without ever finding an opportunity to survive doing that. Um, uh, Charles Ives, for instance, um, 
uh, wrote an awful lot of music they got ignored for an awful long time and managed to survive by being an insurance company executive um, and at some point sort of stopped composing. And it was much later in his life when his music started getting recognized and he started, you know, being celebrated for that. And I don't think there was ever a point in his life where he relied upon it for a, a livelihood, but it didn't stop him from making the music that he made. And there's many, many examples of people like that. Um, in my case, there were two things driving it. One was I really loved playing music and it felt necessary. And the other thing was that I was in circumstances where I didn't have a lot of externally generated and reliable financial support. So I had to figure out how to, how to harness the things that I did know how to do in order to make a living at it. And, um, but those two things are very, 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 very different things. Um, being good at something and being able to survive doing it have very little to do with each other. It's sort of like the difference between art and commerce. And some people are good at both. Some people are good at one, some people are good at the other. Uh, it's unusual to find people who are exceptionally good at, at, at both things, and I don't consider myself to be exceptionally good at the commerce part of it, but I've muddled along fairly well, and you know, you know. The main thing with that is that there's a few rules you have to, to remember in terms of being able to survive, that people want to, they have expectations of you, and you have to sort of realize those expectations. Um, the three things are say yes when people ask you to do something, and sometimes it might not seem like the best idea, but say yes anyhow, and then show up on time, uh, because if you show up late, people are just going to wonder, like, what the heck happened, and why aren't you there, and maybe I should have got somebody else. And the third thing is don't complain, because nobody likes that. So if you do that, you'll actually be successful. It's not that complicated. The, the part about, the creative part of, of what you do is, is something quite different, and that it has more to do with what you enjoy and what you like. And I think, you know, the dedication comes with, with the desire. And if you really like what you're doing or like, you know, I just really enjoy music. So it's not hard to get me to work on music. I'm quite happy to do it. Um, leave me alone in a, you know, quiet place for a while with an instrument and I'll spend the rest of the day making music um, just because it's fun. So that's, it's not like a, not like a labor or a, you know, a, so fulfilling some requirement or something. It's just something that I like to do. Now, when we talk about uh, your early career, we've had many conversations about how you started playing music. And uh, you grew up in an area, the, the San Francisco Bay Area, that was filled with a whole bunch of different type of music. Your earliest uh, saxophone teacher was kind of a free jazz guy. But then there were all these bands like Tower of Power that you eventually worked with that I, I think you moved into a, a, a different approach to music. Um, was you know the way that you play, uh, the the way that your music is like rock and pop influenced, rather than uh, hardcore jazz guy. Um, you've created a niche for yourself in that sense. You've created uh, when somebody hears you play, they say, "Well, that's that's Lenny Pickett, or that's how Lenny plays." Um, how did how did that come about? Well, you know, jazz is a funny thing. Um, it's it depends on what year you're talking about and who you're talking about and where and you know, in um, you know, I've, I've read about Sonny Rollins and and his favorite saxophone player that when he was young was Louis Jordan who was, <clears throat> if you looked at him now, you'd have to consider him a pop musician. Um, but there wasn't a huge distinction at the time between pop music and jazz. In fact, jazz was pop music. Um, if you went out to dance, you went out to dance to jazz. You know, Now you go out and dance to a, a DJ or to hip hop or something. You know, it's a, times have changed. Um, when I was growing up, the popular music that contained saxophones was soul music. 
and people like Junior Walker and King Curtis were playing that. And I wanted to play music for people to dance to um, because I liked I liked to dance and I liked I liked being around dance music and I liked um, I liked to see people dance and and play for them. There's something really fantastic about being in a room full of people who are having a great time and are dancing. You can sort of look at individuals and you can say, oh, like if I play a certain way at this point, that's going to affect the way that they're dancing. And and you have this sort of, uh, this sort of sympathetic back and forth going on with the dancers that's quite amazing. And I just really enjoyed that. Um, so it was was sort of organic. I mean, also it was the music that my generation, you know, I'm 60 now, so that means in 1968 I was listening to Jimi Hendrix and, and Led Zeppelin and, and Sly and the Family Stone and um, The Temptations and all the music that was around at the time. It was just the music of the generation that I was growing up in. And it was pretty interesting music. A, a lot of it had come... I mean, if you look at the people who are making, for instance, Al Green's records, uh, that was Willie Mitchell, who was a jazz pianist, and he was the producer for all of Al Green's stuff, um, the Let's Stay Together period, Still in Love With You period, all that music from that time. So there was a quite a strong involvement um, from jazz musicians, if you want to use that as a distinction, in all the music that we were doing. I, Benny Golson came and interviewed to produced one of the Tower Power albums. We didn't ultimately end up using him, but um, he was, you know, came around to look, look at us. And I, my, you know, I, I ran into um, Herbie Hancock at the time, and he was doing the Headhunters record um, in the early 70s there. And we were working in the same studio, uh, Wally Hyders in San Francisco, and talked, I knew, knew Mike Clark, I knew um, Paul Jackson and those guys. I'd played gigs with them. So there was a, a very fluid crossing over back and forth between music that you went out to dance to and music that you sat down and listened to. Um, uh, in the Bay Area, that was n nothing unusual about that. There was a lot of Latin music. There was a lot of, um, a lot of uh, you know, sort of proto-fusion stuff, you know, things that preceded that. There was a group called Fourth Way with Mike Knock and Mike White, there were, um, uh, you know, it was a, a, a mecca for a lot of musicians um, because, you know, there was this thing in 1967 where they, this song came on the radio, of, uh, you know, if you go to San Francisco, be sure to wear a flower in your hair. And suddenly all these hippie kids like showed up there. And so all these blues musicians showed up to be where the hippie kids were. And so I played with John Lee Hooker for a while. And I, I worked with, uh, you know, I went out to see, um, you know, um, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee play. Um, you could see just and hear just about anything. And everybody came through there. I saw Sonny Rollins play solo at a jazz festival. I, I saw the Skies Over America piece by... Um, Ornick Coleman with uh, Dewey Redmond playing, you know, it was many, 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 many influences all at once. And I think you end up being uh, the, the sum total of your experience. And my experience was huge. I mean, I saw uh, Willie Mae Thornton sing Hound Dog and play harmonica at the first jazz festival in Berkeley. And I saw, um, uh, what's his, who's the, John Handy. Um, play uh, Stern Grove uh, with his group at some time not long after he played with Charles Mingus. And so it was, it, uh, you know, the results, what, what ended up influencing my playing was mostly the, what was on the radio and what I was hearing in the clubs and what I was hearing on the streets and, um, and just, just the environmental experience of living in the Bay Area in the, in the 60s and 70s, really. We could, can you talk about uh, two of these influences that you, you mentioned before, Junior Walker and King Curtis, and how they kind of shaped your... Uh... Well, you know, if you wanted to play with your friends or people your age, you had to play music that was on the radio at the time. So um, I, you know, was aware of Junior Walker from listening to the radio, and I thought... And I, was in a band that um, wanted to cover some of those songs, so I just... What were they playing on the radio at the time? Uh, well, what, what Does It Take was a big hit. Um, 
Well, Shotgun was earlier. Um, I, I'd heard Shotgun, of course. I knew those albums and stuff. But What Does It Take was like the, the Junior's last big hit. And I, I was very uh, drawn to the, the King Curtis solo in Respect and Aretha Franklin's record. Um, um, but I knew, you know, Shake and Finger Pop and, uh, um, you know, uh, Roadrunner and all those other Junior Walker tunes. And, and I learned the solos off the records um, because that was a way of being popular with other musicians who were playing that stuff. You could go and then play the solo from Shotgun, and that was kind of a cool thing to be able to do. But I was also learning like uh, George Harrison solos off of Beatles records and learning Jimi Hendrix licks off of Jimi Hendrix records. And, uh, you know, I was listening to a lot of different things and... Uh, just because they were there and 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 they were exciting. I mean, there's sort of nothing quite as exciting guitar playing wise as what Hendrix was doing in the '60s. Even to this day, it's hard to find something that's that galvanizing and that interesting. Um, you know, and I, I remember sitting at the back door of um, a club because I was too young to get in and listening to Stanley Turrentine play a set. And it was just whatever was around. Um, I, my stepfather was a musician also, and he had a huge record collection. So I listened to all that Blue Note stuff from the 60s, the, um, you know, Lee Morgan. And also he loved Clifford Brown, so I listened to Clifford. He was a trumpet player. Um, and he had all the Impulse, John Coltrane stuff too. Um, so it was just, and also radio. Radio in the Bay Area was awesome. There was a radio station called KMPX and a radio station called KSAN. And they were both open format was what they called it. So you might sit down and listen to an hour of Bob Dylan and then they'd do an hour of Ravi Shankar and then you might get an hour of John Coltrane and maybe they'd do like a sort of a tour of world music, you know, they weren't calling it that back then, but you'd, so you'd hear some West African music and you'd hear some, you know, some Asian music and all different sorts of things. And that was on all the time, but almost no commercials. Um, you could turn on KMPX and listen to it all afternoon and barely hear a commercial because it was, you know, it was FM back then. FM wasn't a big deal. It wasn't the commercial area, the radio dial and, and, um, um, there are certain hours of the day where they weren't likely to make very much money anyhow, so they just let, let the DJs roll. And also we had a great jazz station. We had uh, K-Jazz, and I knew the guys. The, when I was a kid, I knew Herb Wong, and I knew uh, Manfred Funk, and uh, some of the other guys that were, were DJs on the radio show. And see, Berkeley was a pretty small area. I, I made friends with, uh, there's a kid named John Bendick, whose father was Al Bendick, who was the one of the lawyers that was in, at the head of um, Fantasy Records. And so we used to be able to go down to Fantasy and watch recording sessions happen. I saw um, I saw a big band session with um, Cannonball Adderley. Um, it was interesting, very, very, you know, lots of different musical opportunities, lots of things. And we didn't think uh, twice about it. We never, we never considered it. it. Was just like it was just part of our reality. I worked for Bill Graham a little bit, just handing out posters. Bill Graham was the impresario who ran Fillmore West and and Winterland and places like that. Who later became Tower Power's manager, and uh, was collaborated with Tower Power quite a bit. But when I was maybe 15, 16 years old. I would go to one of his venues and pass out leaflets, and but we'd have back, backstage access. So I, I met uh, um, Howard Johnson when he was playing with uh, Taj Mahal, and I met um, Frank Zappa and sat down and talked with him for half an hour at one point. And all this was just everywhere in the air there. It was, um, you know, the, the, the pro my musical output is a product of a of, of very... Uh, rich cultural immersion that just happened. I just was lucky enough to be in that part of the world at a time when uh, it was a gathering spot for many, many people. Well, in, my, in these interviews, I always talk about um, at some point you move from being a student of the music or a spectator into being uh, somebody, you're Lenny Pickett, and now you're Lenny Pickett, uh, the recognized Lenny Pick person that somebody knows it's actually in the business. 
and you've created a name for yourself. How did, uh, how did that bridge happen? Well, I used to play with bands that were, you know, we played parties. We did um, um, proms and, and uh, um, you know, birthday parties, and we'd play nightclubs. You know, I was pretty young. We'd lie about our ages and do nightclub gigs. How old were you? I f first gig was 14. I played with a group called James Levi and the Funk Machine. Um, James Levi later on ended up playing on some Herbie Hancock recordings. Um, but he had a little group. It was um, Carl Lockett was playing guitar. He ended up with um, playing guitar with um, Chuck Mangione for a while. And his brother, uh, Charles, played bass. Um, a guy named Wesley Johnson played trumpet. It was a small group. And we played this club called the Machismo Club. Um, I was usually the only white person in the club, and, and I was definitely the youngest. But I, I practiced at this park called Bushrod Park in North Oakland, near the Black Panther headquarters. And I used to, um, and J James Levi used to do like pickup basketball games there, and he heard me playing. And he, he was only 21 at the time, and he came over and asked me to, you know, would I do some gigs with him? And I said, I'd never done gigs, but sure. And so I went and did that. And um, I've been practicing like incessantly. And then uh, that sort of fizzled. And a little later, I met some kids at like the local high school. I, st I stopped going to school then, but I, but I knew, you know, my friends of the same age. And so we put bands together, played, uh, we had a band called the Bad Dogs that was, um, two saxophones, bass, and drums, and we did Hendrix covers. Um, we did, um, I had a, was in a group called Rags that did like some Zeppelin stuff and some Steve Winwood covers and also original music um, and played like frat parties and things like that. And then I put together a band with some friends called Lynx, which was um, a um, R&B group and sort of had a harmonica player, lead singer, and me, and we were sort of the horn section also, and then uh, got a trombone player who's now the chef at Barbudo, Jonathan Waxman, who um, was trombone player. Then um, Pat O'Hara played with us, um, uh, who played with um, Azteca for a while, which was a sort of popular group in the Bay Area. And we got gigs opening for Tower of Power and other people like that. and. So I met them. I also met them through my my teacher, Bert Wilson, uh, was friends with them as well. Small small world. Um, and um, um, they let their tenor player go at some point and needed another tenor player. And so I they asked me, and I said sure. And I was 18 at the time. And uh, then suddenly I was on the road and doing albums and playing on other people's records and. And all that. It happened just very organically. Uh, I was, when they called, I, my group had disbanded and I was been out of work for a couple of months and sort of struggling playing on the streets, you know, make lunch money. And, uh, uh, you know, me and my brother and a roommate were living alone, or the, you know, my, we asked my mom to move out. Uh, she was dealing drugs out of our house and it got to be too crazy. So, uh, we just asked her to move, and she did. And so we got a roommate, and at first it was the roadie for the band I was in, and then uh, the harmonica player for a while. And and then I got this gig with Tower of Power and started touring and did that for nine years, and then had a baby and decided that maybe being on the road wasn't so great for having a family. So I moved to New York because it was either L.A. or New York or... And I'd been to L.A. enough and knew I didn't want to do that. And so I came out here. My wife was a dancer. She had a career doing modern dance, so it made sense to go where she had been. And uh, immediately, you know, I met people along the way. I'd met um, Tom Malone. I'd met um, Michael Brecker. Michael turned me on to some gigs. Tom turned me on to some gigs. Uh, met Lou Marini. He turned me on to some gigs. And I joined, when you come to New York back in the day, you signed up with this thing called Radio Registry, which was an answering service. And I know that sounds incredibly antique, but it was what you did. 
and Radio Registry acted sort of as your booking agent, kind of, and also as your answering service. And if you got popular and they knew it, then if a random call came in for a saxophone player, you might get it because they felt better about recommending somebody who was popular than... So gradually over time, I got to be a sort of, you know, more prominent presence in the recording studio scene, and I got more and more calls, and um, just totally by accident through a couple of gigs um, that I did, I ended up with um, the Saturday Night Live gig. Um, but it was a progression. It wasn't like, gee, I'm going to go to New York and make a big wave and have a big career and get all important and stuff. Um, it was just like, oh, somebody I met on the road um, was, uh, you know, has some opportunity for me someplace. And um, so there's the, th there's the fourth rule. I told you about um, say yes and show up on time and never complain. The last one is it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Um, when you, when you're currently, I'm working at Saturday Night Live and one, there are producers that used to work as the receptionists and you never know when this is going to happen to you. And you never know when the musician you meet someplace randomly is going to be somebody who's going to, you know, have an enormous career and some influence over the world of music. So just, you know, be nice. It's not, it's not that hard. Words to live by. Hey, let's go back because I want you to talk about um, what you were practicing incessantly in that park in Berkeley. <laughs> I was playing long tones, mostly. Um, a lot of long tones and a lot of scales and occasionally etudes, but it wasn't conducive to doing etudes because I couldn't get the music stand thing worked out with the wind and all that. So mostly just scales and melodic patterns and, and uh, uh, lots and lots of long tones. Long tones starting very quiet and getting very loud and getting quiet and doing it all the way through all the registers of the instrument, you know, one note at a time. Like I do all the long tones really, really quiet all the way up to like really high notes and then come back down and then then I do like loud ones and then I do loud to soft to loud and then I do scales and I articulate each one differently. I, you know, play each note twice and I play them in thirds and fourths and fifths and sixths and then uh, all just any, any exercise I could imagine that might be useful to, you know, help my technique along. And Based on this, this is why that uh, other rock band hired you because you're playing, they like the way you're playing long tones. No, it was just that, um, and, and it was, it, it, it was just that, I think it was because he, I don't really know why James hired me. I think it might, I, my guess is that, um, that I was just so anomalous, you know, it was a, it was a black neighborhood. I was a white kid with a saxophone there for seven or eight hours a day what the heck was going on, you know? And he just came up and talked to me. And, and I think I played, occasionally played a song, you know? Um, um, but, and maybe he heard me playing the high notes and thought, oh, maybe that's Junior Walker sort of thing or something, you know? I don't know, I was not exactly the right person for that job. Um, I couldn't remember the horn parts and nothing was written down. And I used to have to ask Wesley, I'd say, Wesley, 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 How's this next one start? He'd go, B flat, A, 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 B flat, A. I go, but but which ones? <laughs> you know? And what, what's the rhythm? So he wouldn't sing it to me, he'd just like tell me the notes. And and I was like, I was so lost sometimes. Um that was an interesting gig. Um I mean I learned some of the music and I learned it by ear and have it down, but we were learning so many songs and so fast, and sometimes we'd learn songs like this group would come in, the singing group would come to the nightclub and we'd go back to the dressing room and then we'd learn a song with them. And like, you know, just remembering that stuff was, was always challenging for me. I, I, it was, I was 14, I was very inexperienced. Wow. Now, uh, one of your signature uh, techniques on the saxophone is your altissimo or the, the upper extended register range of the saxophone. And uh, for people that aren't musicians, you're actually 
playing on the overtone series like uh, a trumpet player or a French horn player, trombone player, brass player. Uh, how did that come about? Because that really has kind of set you apart from most other saxophone players in the world. Um, well, it, a lot of different things. I was a clarinet player first, and I knew that, like, you know, all the woodwind instruments actually use those notes. They don't use as many of, many of those overtones as the brass instruments do, but, but if you're a flute player, you're definitely playing, the, you know, third harmonic and fourth harmonic stuff in order to get the, the upper register out. And the clarinet the same way. I think clarinet, you actually get a, you know, the legitimate written range will have you playing notes that are maybe fifth harmonic, uh, uh, and it's a different overtone series. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, it was built into the woodwind instruments anyhow. Uh, I, I had been a clarinet player, so I knew that the instrument extended beyond what the fingering chart that I got in the um, Paul DeVille book was. Paul DeVille book went up to F, and it had two fingerings for F, and that was about it. And I, I knew it went farther than that. So I tried ex initially experimenting with using clarinet sort of fingerings to get the same thing. And then my stepfather was a trumpet player, and he practiced these things called lip flexibility exercises that were all harmonics, and um, he showed me how the harmonic series worked on the trumpet, and I discovered like, by playing the lowest fingerings on the saxophone that I could get sort of a, you know, I could play the harmonic series pretty easily, and I just sort of worked my way up the instrument doing that. Um, initially just getting the, harmon the natural harmonics out of the instrument, and then started to experiment with trying to get fingerings that were had better intonation, and sometime along that way, uh, someone introduced me to the Sigurd Rascher book, and which was helpful too because it had those overtone exercises in it. And gradually, over time, I I found fingerings that worked fluidly, so you could play not just you know the the random high note, but but be able to play articulated scales and that sort of thing in that, in that register. But you had mentioned that uh, one of the reasons you started playing the, the high register was because you never had a microphone. Well, I'd, I'd been playing it before that, but one of the reasons it became part of my like rhythm and blues solo style was because it was just ammunition. You know, if you can't, if, if, if your guitar player has a twin reverb and your bass player has an SVT, and your drummer's playing like you know a kit with two tom toms and four cymbals, and 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 everybody's and there's a PA system for the singer, and you get to play the PA system, but there's only one monitor speaker, and the singer obviously gets that, and you're listening for the PA system, and it's out in the room, and the, the only chance you have is to get an octave above the rest of the band. Um, so I started playing up there initially a lot just to be able to hear what the heck I was doing. Um, I mean, I'd been practicing up there, but then it became necessary to develop like stylistic approaches to how to play there so that it would you know, have some musical sense. And also there's just nothing like a good crazy high note to get the audience all jazzed up. Um, it's like, you know, it's, if you, you know, if you're, if you're, in, a, in this environment where you're an entertainer, and I spent most of my life as an entertainer, you want to be entertaining. So, so high notes are good for entertainment. Um, um, you know, and you notice that immediately, probably too. Oh, sure. It's like you know, if you give a good, you know, crazy scream, you know, it resonates with people because they all have a crazy scream inside them somewhere. They're just afraid to let it out. So if you're channeling that crazy scream for them, it's like, it's exhilarating. You know, it's like you, you know, I, everybody's saying, gee, I wish I could scream like that because that's how I feel right now. But that guy's doing it for me. So excellent. Um. Well, you know, combining that with uh, the other night you were teaching your ensemble at NYU and I was sitting next to you watching you play and watching the music uh, uh, I see the chord changes is like eight bars of D minor mm -hmm. and uh, from, a, from a jazz standpoint I'm gonna you know normally see somebody running scales and instead of that you're doing all these soul inflections uh, growls trills up in the upper register uh it's more like a a singer singing little licks and phrases rather than thinking about the harmony and thinking about 
transpositions and such? Well, you know, I, if you listen... It's more vocal. Well, if you listen to jazz from the 20s, that's pretty much what it was. I mean, it was people playing melodically and, and expressively much the way singers did. And if you listen to jazz from the 30s, it's also quite similar to that. You listen to, you know, uh, Artie Shaw playing in the 30s, and he's got some licks happening, but he's playing melodies all over the place. And it was only after the advent of bebop, and even if you listen to Bird play on, like, like when he's playing with Jay McShann, he's playing incredibly soulful sort of blues solos. And to me, what's always been most interesting about Bird's playing was was the the inflective aspect of it, not the note running thing. And then, but that became a thing. And then you had people like John Coltrane and Sonny Stitt and people like that playing lots of notes as well. But if you listen to Train at the end of his life, um, you know, in, in those last few records that he did, it becomes, it goes back to being a lot more expressive and, 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 and vocal sounding. And I think, I think that, that jazz, Here's the thing. Here's my theory on this. Um, I think that the the tendency for jazz to have moved into a direction where harmonic complexity is at its sort of the essential aspect of it, and move away from melodic inflection as an as its sort of central aspect. This has to do with the fact that it's easy to teach harmonic complexity. It's very difficult to teach uh, melodic inflection. Um, and jazz education was born more or less in the 50s. And since the advent of jazz education, you, you look for people can come up with methods. It's easy to write, it's easy for someone like Jamie Abersole to write out a syllabus of scales that might go along with a, a, um, a given chord progression. It's very difficult to tell people how to make something have a, a mode of impact. And, you know, it, you can, the best way to do that is to listen to other people doing it and imitate it, which was the way that jazz was traditionally learned, which at the knee of other, other jazz musicians. And you learn that inflective uh, ability by being around people who inflected. If you learn strictly out of a book or, or you learn from, from a method um, or you learn from theoretical standpoint, you might get very good at, 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 at interpolating different harmonic textures over one another, which is, I think, quite interesting and uh, musically interesting. And I, I certainly played around with that quite a bit. But I don't think that it's necessarily the, the route to getting into the hearts and souls of the listener. Um, and that might be one of the reasons why jazz sells only 2% of total record sales right now, is that there's a tendency for complexity to rule over, over expression. And I think that's largely the blame, you know, the blame for that lies largely in music, in jazz education. And it's not really jazz education's fault exactly, it's because it's just, it's just trying to teach somebody how to be, how to be somebody is a lot more difficult than teaching somebody how to play a, you know, B-flat diminished um, scale. Well, uh, we've, we've had these conversations before about... Uh, uh, I actually remember asking you specifically when you were on your show all these years on SNL. I said, Lenny, do you ever screw up? you ever go for that high note and it's not there? And your response was, no. <laughs> not usually. <laughs> I mean, no. Uh, 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 Does this come from a sense of repetition and uh, just like total practicing all the well, time and, well, and you know i mean in a conversation occasionally one blunders and says the wrong word that's not normal it's normal for you to say the right words and say what you intended you know you might have meant to say banana and you said asparagus and people will laugh at you but that doesn't happen too often um when when you're playing music from a standpoint of of, of extreme familiarity with, with the language that you're using, it's unlikely that you're going to play something completely crazy and wrong. You're, you're probably going to play the thing that you know is right because that's just the leaning, that's how you lean. We, you know, musicians hopefully have embodied the music that they're playing and aren't just like playing at the music, they're playing, playing the music because it comes from inside of them. Um, 
that happens through long, you know, long effort at that. But you know, we all speak English, and we do pretty good with that. And uh, or those of us who speak English do pretty well with that. And if we speak another language, we've you know acclimated ourselves to that. And we do pretty well with that. And music is just another language. I don't, I don't see that it's that remarkable that you would go around playing and not making mistakes and expressing yourself in a in a clear way if you have comfort with that. Well, how long did it take you to feel comfortable with that language? Well, I think it, you you know like. My English is still getting better. Um, I still um, learn new words and that sort of thing. So I, I think it's more progressive. I mean, I, I was pretty good at English when I was, you know, around seven or eight years old. I got a lot better by the time I was in my adolescence. And I, I, it continues to improve because I still read and I listen to other people talk. And the same is true with music. Um, I was actually a pretty good musician in my estimation at the time when I was nine years old. I used to improvise on the clarinet when I started playing. And, and it felt totally comfortable. I'm sure it was quite naive. Um, if I listened back to it now, I'd find it you know, really you know, probably um, you know, childlike. Um, but that made sense, you know. I, I, for me, I think my progression as a musician is, has developed as I've developed as a person, and I got better at music as I got better at everything else, and it's just, it just happens to be something I do every day of my life. Um, so, Well, I want to talk about SNL for a little bit. Mm -hmm. You've been a member of the band for now 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us how you got that gig? Um, G.E. Smith and Howard Shore hired me. I'd met G.E. through some gigs with um, Hall & Oates when he was back with them. Uh, I'd done this gig with them at, at the Apollo Theater with Eddie Kendricks and David Ruffin from The Temptations. And um, I guess they liked what I did on that and they hired me to do some other gigs. I did Live Aid, the first Live Aid, and I did the first Farm Aid gigs with them. And so I had this connection with, with at GE through that, and then GE, that following the, I guess, within a year after I'd done those gigs with them, he got the job being the band leader at Saturday Night Live and thought of me and called me up and hired me. And then Howard Shore also knew who I was. He'd been in this Canadian band that was sort of like, a, it wasn't exactly like Tower of Power, but probably more like maybe Blood, Sweat, and Tears or something. It was a big, it was, a, it, they did, they had a large ensemble, which was unusual at the time, and they had a lot of horns in it, and he had been with them. Uh, I think this is before he went to Berkeley. Um, anyhow, Howard knew of me through, you know, this being in the circle of large, you know, orchestrally sort of oriented rock bands, and uh, so they hired me. And um, I started out as doing some arranging for them, as well as, as, um, as playing the saxophone solos, and so I uh, had like a some input into the, you know, mostly I was taking assignments for my arrangements, but I was I was making a contribution to the music as well. So I guess you know, and it came time that they were looking for somebody else to do that job, uh, the band leader job, and they hired me to do that. Um, so it's sort of again a, a sort of natural progression of of things, you know, meet people doing different things. I, I met the GE, I met the Hall and Oates people through Tommy Matola, who had been the manager of a guy named Arthur Baker, who had hired me to be to do some sessions for him to make samples for other records and things like that. So, how much pressure are you under being the director? Um, I want to do a good job. You know, I, I, I really want to deliver. I mean, Lauren Michaels uh, has put together a, a really, really talented group of people. And, and it's an incredibly collaborative, um, interactive organization. There's, uh, we, we have to know everybody in all the different trades. I know the lighting department people very well. I know wardrobe very well. I know, um, I know the you know the audio department. I know the hair and makeup people. I know everybody. I because that's part of what, what I know cue cards, because the job entails interacting with every other aspect of the television show. Um, I know the cameraman by name. I know the you know and 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 I and I feel like I'm part of the family that that makes the the TV show there, and I feel like 
as a family member, I'm obligated to to bring the thing that where where my talent lies. And so, I don't look at it as being pressure so much. I look at it as being more like um, I have a sense of obligation to deliver, uh, you know, a, a, a good product for the for the the show to make it be what it the best part of it that I can make. Now, what we do on the show most people don't see. And a lot of what my job is, is keeping the atmosphere in the room okay um, for the audience. Because most of the playing we do is during commercial when, when, the, when uh, we, you know, the, they're selling products on the show uh, and we're, we're busy entertaining this uh, audience of people who sent away for their tickets uh, six months ago and are um, you know, from any part of the country and, and trying to keep that energy going in the room so that the comedy, when it returns, isn't coming back to a lull. And also we, we warm the house up before we start the show. So we're, we're, we're essentially a, a side aspect of the entertainment, you know, that's, you know, we, we contribute to the show as well. We make music whenever the show needs music, but we, you know, and I work with a lot of people. I, Currently, I, I'm just one of three composers on the show. Um, Eli Brueggemann has been composing with us, and Liam Pendarvis does that as well. There's, there's, there's three music directors. I, my job is principally to direct the band and to organize all the band stuff. But that means things like um, make sure they show up at wardrobe at the beginning of the season to get their costumes uh, fitted for them. And to, you know, if the substitute musician comes along, to make sure that they're prepared. So send PDF files and MP3s out to them ahead of time so that they show up. So there's a lot of it sort of, you know, routine and mundane sort of work. But it's necessary for the product to be good, um, you know, or go talk to audio if there's an issue with the way that the sound is coming across or, you know, that, that kind of thing. But I guess the pressure cooker comes when uh, you're on air and you're the guy that's directing all the cues and I know you use your watch. Well, well I, you know, I, again, it's a, it's a shared responsibility. Uh, you know, I'm getting the person from the director's talking to Leon and I in the PL and we're, Leon and I are trading off on the cueing and stuff. We, we don't do it all. I don't do everything. And, and I, 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 I don't look at it as, you know, in the beginning, I, the first couple of shows, I was shaking in my shoes, admittedly, because I was I was psyched out by the by the idea that there were eight or ten million people watching me, and I didn't want to screw it up. Um, now I'm just playing for the house audience. I'm just doing I'm just doing what I do, um, and we're the, I, I'm very cognizant of the the technical apparatus that's around me and how it's working. I know the length of every commercial break. I know I know which which camera is where. I know like, you know, if they're going to do the introduction for the guest band, if they're going to do it from home base or they're going to do it from someplace else, you know, whether I have to have the band cleared off, how many seconds I have to do that. All all those things, all those details that audiences would never know about. Of course, I'm cognizant of all that. But it's not it, it's 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 sort of like um it's not so much different than making donuts. You know, like you have to get the dough the right consistency and the oil has to be hot enough and then the machine has to be working properly and then you have to keep them warm after you've made them. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm just making donuts. It's not that different. Yeah. Well, at the same time, you're, uh, you're organizing the band, you're writing the music, you're, you're waiting for the cues, you're getting direction from the people in the booth. And you're the soloist on, on most of the tunes, and you're the voice, you're the sound of that whole band. Well, that's... that's so? <laughs> it's but like for it's most a, mere mortals, that's, uh, that's way over the top. It, it, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't really reflect on it. It's like, I, I, I suppose if I... If now I, I freaked I, you I, out. I, no, I, no, you haven't. I suppose if I, if I had to start from like zero like if as a nine-year-old kid i had to like go and do that it would be impossible but you know arranging for a band i learned that along the way um playing solos while other stuff was going on and learned that along the way um like by the time i arrived at this particular job i would accumulated a lot of the necessary skills to be able to do it the things that were different are the highly technical nature of the job and the timing. Those are the things that I had to learn that were new and different. And I've figured them out. It's, I've been doing it for band leading for 20 years now on a TV show. It's, I don't really think about it as, as like a scary sort of thing. It's more like, oh, we have 30 seconds to go. Okay, let's wrap it up. <laughs> you know? oh, oh, it's, it's time to start. Um, 
cue the drummer. <laughs> you know, um, you know that's it's not that spectacular. I'm sure for other people it, it might be more nerve wracking, but at this point, and I don't mean this in any sort of vain or or you know proud sort of way. It's just it it just got to be after a long time. It got to be normal, and um, I think anything else would be. I, I, I lately they've been digging up Hudson Street and laying in a new uh, water main. And there's this guy with this, he's got a front loader with the, with the backhoe thing on it. And he's so amazing. I watched this guy with the backhoe out there. He can pick up a chunk of concrete and dump it in a truck. And then he uses it for like a battering ram and he, he, he's putting in pilings. And I'm going, how in the world does that guy work that gizmo? It's like, and he does it so deftly. It looks like a hand grabbing a, you know, like a, like a, a ball or something like that. It looks so natural. And I just think, but I'm sure for him, it's like, that's what he does every day. And well, knowing you, I could see you going out and playing duets with him. I, I'm happy to watch. Well, let me, <laughs> let me just say this, because we, we traveled to Mongolia last uh -huh. year. And, uh, and, you know, there's climate change and affects reeds and all these things. And, and I remember I had one big solo piece that every time I get to this high note, it would, it would crack. You remember that? And it's like, oh, and you were saying, no, play this finger, no, play this finger. And uh, so we get to the concert, the note cracked, you know, and then you said to me afterwards, because, you know, there's, uh, you know, what I do is like, uh, I, you, you showed me all your reads you had prepared. You had like 10 different reads just in case. So there's always a backup. If something is not quite working, you're, you're, you've prepared. Yeah, redundancy is important. Yeah. You, with saxophone playing, the only thing that really matters or the thing that matters the most is this read. And if you don't have a good read, you can't make a good saxophone sound. So like, um, like I keep... Let's see about 30 some odd reads sort of going you know like they're in various stages of of development uh, some of them need to be played on a little bit more before i'm comfortable playing them on a gig some of them are just past their prime but they're pretty good for practicing on um uh you know they all have different stages of the you know because uh, the wood is a natural material and it's going to break down and and um and it's the it's a you know it's it's a key weak weak link in the whole process because you're reliant on something that can't be exactly you know uh, recreated at any given point and that every single read you pick up is going to be a little bit different so there's an adaptation that you have to do whenever you do it so you want as many things that are roughly in the area and I'm very fortunate I work with Van Doren uh, read company and they let me go to their shop here in New York and pick out my reads one at a time so I can actually I'm I get really good averages on reads at this point um, yeah but uh, your secret is you don't actually play a tenor saxophone read right I'm playing a bass clarinet read um, it's a number three and a half blue box Fandor and bass clarinet read which is kind of a, a little unusual but it really makes sense I use a I use I have an old um, Cordier uh, reed trimmer that fits my mouthpiece. So I take a tiny sliver off the top as I, when I prepare the reed and I break them in sort of slowly, but there's a little bit more um, wood right down the center of the reed on the bass clarinet reeds than there is on the tenor sax reeds. And I like that because especially playing the altissimo a lot, um, the reed will sometimes have a tendency to warp in the middle and these tend to hold up better and last a little bit longer. So, uh, as we wrap up here, what what do you uh, what are your other aspirations in life? Do you just want to continue playing music? Yeah, music is is kind of my deal. Um, I want grandchildren, um, but that can't control that. Um, let's see, because um, I'd like to take my grandchildren fishing, and I'd like to play them jazz records, and um, and. It just would be really fun to hang out with small people again. Um, I, I'm good with music, you know. I have a lot. I, I have a project I'm working on right now, which is um, I did this piece for a modern dancer. I used to do a lot of music for modern dancers, um, and I did this piece with for her. Uh, it was the most ambitious recording thing I ever did, and I'm going to play a little bit of it later. Um, it was um, I did all the tracks myself. Um, uh, and there are 72 different woodwind parts uh, on this, and and some percussion that I played also. 
And I, a friend of mine made the album cover for my Borneo Horns album, and he passed away recently, but I talked to his widow, and I've gotten some artwork that's sort of perfect for this. So I'm, I'm going to do something a little um, unorthodox. I'm going to put together a, an LP, get it mastered, and, and put this piece. It's about 30-some-odd minutes long. And put it on uh, on vinyl and with this artwork, um, and only print up uh, you know a modest number of copies. You know uh, my sense of the music industry and and the way that this works is that it's pretty much finished. Um, you know y when you get your royalty statement from Spotify, uh, it's you know each each unit is like point oh 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 one cents, and and uh, you know you have a I get from Tower of Power royalties that I still receive, I get about one-tenth of the money I get for, for uh, it used to be about eight pages, now it looks like a phone book. And it's just the way the royalty distribution has worked with, the, with Spotify and Pandora and these sort of streaming uh, systems. So I, don't, I think it's more interesting to make something that's, uh, that actually you can hold in your hand and look at it and there's some artwork on it and it's, um, has some sort of value beyond that. And I, th I think there's a shift away from that. So I'm looking at that project, I'm looking at a project. I, I wrote an opera a number of years ago, and we had a, couple, a bunch of workshops, but never had a full production. And I'm contemplating uh, doing an actual recording of it in the studio to see if I can get some, some people interested in that. And I have a lot of material I've been working on over the years that's intended to be performed as solos. And uh, I think it makes sense because it's like a low overhead and you can just go and play someplace. And I've been doing that a bit, but I'm trying to do more of that. Um, but all my aspirations aside from family have to do with, um, with music. So I know you've given us a lot of food for thought today, but in closing, is there something, uh, some words of wisdom, some uh, supportive information you can give to all those musicians who love the way you play and love the, the music that you represent and listen to SNL and recognize you and they say, wow, I'd, I'd like to pursue music too because of you. I don't really know how to answer that question. Um, um, it, it, you know, life is just so random. Um, I would hate to get anybody's expectations up. And, uh, you know, I, I can only speak for myself and, and uh, you know, the way that I approach music is, is not in the least bit grandiose. It's more like just what came one, one foot in front of the other. And I, I have a feeling based on that experience that, that most of life is just that, one foot in front of the other and see what happens. And like you started out asking me, the, I think the, the most important thing anybody can remember is that stuff doesn't get done immediately. It, it's through tenacity and persistence and um, diligence and, and um, desire that anything ever actually gets done. Excellent. Thanks for your uh, expert advice. Lenny Pickett, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.
Mm-hmm. 